So uh, let me start by saying that, um, you know, the St. John's River is a rather unique fishery uh, in all of North America for these fish. It is the first place that they actually show up um, in late December. And, you know, they can be had all the way into March and obviously it depends on water temperature. So without further ado, I'm gonna go off of the thing here on, and move forward. There we go, okay. So um, yeah, so the St. John's River population of Shad, it represents the, uh, the southernmost population of them. Uh, it's extremely unique in that the river itself is basically a swamp. Uh, you desperately search for areas where there's a, a little bit of current so that you can find the areas where the Shad concentrate. Uh, in the meantime, you're traveling through some absolutely beautiful areas with palm trees, alligators, you know, spoonbills, all kinds of beautiful birds, uh, and warm weather in January when everyone else, you know, in our general area in the Northeast are freezing. So it, to me, it's a great experience. Um, it's not a numbers game. I mean, uh, some of us that fish the Potomac know you can have 100 shad days. Uh, in Florida, you know, in a boat in this area, you're lucky to get you know, 10 to 20 would be a very, very good day. I mean, I'm happy with 10. I'm happy with one actually, but uh, it's, it's not a numbers game. It's more about scenery, having a vacation, you know, catching some shad. A lot of other fish there too, which I'll show you some pictures of. Um, so let me, let me go to this slide. So I wanna, I wanna compare the Potomac to the St. John's. Uh, the Potomac total river length is 405 miles. Elevation changes over 3000 feet. Um, the average flow is over 11,000 cubic feet per second, which is a lot. Uh, drainage basin, 14,000 plus miles. And the geology, it's, you know, it, it starts out in the mountains in the western part of the state. So it's, it's got a long run. Uh, the St. John's, by example, by comparison, uh, the total length is 310 miles. Over 310 miles, this river changes in elevation 30 total feet, which averages out to about one inch per mile or less which is a lake essentially. So you're, that's why I said finding a shad in St. John's is, is about finding the current. Uh, drainage basin, similar, you know, it's only 8,800 square miles. Uh, and the geology is extremely interesting in that the sediment underlying the river is ice aged kind of sand and gravel type stuff that was, you know, on the outwash plain from the glaciers. However, underneath there's limestone and many springs pop up and feed the river as tributaries. Um, the, actual, the actual channel of the river used to be a, a comparative um, body of water to the Indian River Inlet in that there was a barrier island to the east. Uh, and this is when the glaciers um, kind of had melted back in you know about, I don't know, 20,000 years ago, give or take. Um, the glaciers had melted, so the river, I'm sorry, the ocean level was much higher. Uh, and so the actual uh, area that the St. John's flows through was an embayment of salt water. And the, the actual east, eastern uh, bank of the river and then the subsequent beach was, was actually the eastern side of the river. So it's a very unique geology, per se, and, and compared to anything that we on the, you know, anywhere above Florida, definitely see different types of um, drainage. So, all right, I'm gonna go next one. So again, the watershed is, it's called the River of Lakes. There is, I'm gonna show you a map and it's just gonna cover a small area, but the place is nothing but lakes. And you fish for shad between the lakes where there's actually some flowing water or hopefully some flowing water. Um, the river is also very tannic acid colored. It, it has very low visibility. It's, you know, that, that graph that was shown earlier by John about the turbidity, um, I would love to see one on this river. If you can see two feet in this river, that's a lot. It's generally a foot or less. So, so to get your lures in front of these fish, it's difficult. That, that's another reason why you probably don't catch huge numbers. Um, near the mouths of some of the springs, however, the water does clear up. Uh, and we could talk, well, I'll talk about that a little later. You know, some of those springs become, you know, congregating areas for these fish. Um, Again, and so, yeah, just to get the gradient, the upper, upper 42 miles uh, has a gradient of nine feet, 2.6 2 inches per mile. So that's the rapid area. That's the fast water on the St. John's River, 2.6 inches per mile. So just think about that when you're, when you're thinking, you know, all the rivers that you fish on the East Coast or further North. Okay, so the place that I'm fishing 
uh, with friends is a place called Shad Alley. Uh, I discovered this, um, this is this, this kind of obsession started in the early 80s with shad fishing in the low in the Delaware River and surrounding areas. Um, and I would read books, there was no internet in those days. So I'd read books. And I found this Reader's Digest condensed book of fishing, which was a really bizarre book, you know, it's like a quarter book at a library somewhere. And I'm some kid and I'm looking at this book and they talked about a shad run in Florida. Shad run in Florida, isn't it too hot there? That's what I thought. So, you know, I did some reading. I did some calling around. I found a marina. The marina said, oh yeah, we have a shad derby. Shad derby, what? Okay, cool. So my friend Tom Graham and I, we drove down. Um, I actually believe uh, he may have drove, driven his boat down that time. But regardless, we... There, there was boat libraries everywhere, um, tackle stores. The river was alive with people. And this was in January. And it, again, beautiful weather, comparatively speaking to, you know, the Philadelphia area. And we could, you could rent a boat for 25 bucks or 30 bucks for the entire day. A little rowboat, you could troll up and down the river. It was amazing. And, and you know, we caught shad and we were, we were happy. We thought it was a, a, the coolest thing. But, you know, it was, this is, we started in 89. And I think our last year was 1996. Um, Got married, had some kids, kind of life caught up with me. I didn't get back there until about five years ago. Uh, in that five-year period, all of the boat libraries have gone out of business or were taken over by, uh, there, was, there was a road that came through the Route 46 bridge in Sanford where they, where they, they literally just bulldozed the, the several houses that were along the edge of the river. Um, there was no place to rent a boat. We didn't know what to do you know, five years ago. So we found a boat launch a boat area downstream of the Shad Alley, about, I want to say, eight to 10 miles. We went out, we threw darts. We found the mouth of the Wakiba River, which is like a national or a, a, a state sanctuary for birds. And we caught hickory shad. So we said, oh, success. There's still shad here. We hadn't, you know, hadn't been there for, you know, 15, 20 odd years. Uh, so, so that's basically my talk is going to be pictures from mostly recently, um, where to get a boat is it's almost impossible to access this river without a boat. There are some areas upstream um, that are near the, 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 the junction of the Econoclatchy River. Uh, a lot of the fly fishermen uh, kind of congregate around that river. It's, it's kind of a, a beautiful area. There's some walks, real flat land, uh, cows, and it has the highest per capita population of alligators in all of Florida. And these are big <laughs> alligators. And I see, you know, there's, there's a website, um, I'm sorry, a Facebook page. It's called Shad on the Fly. And I'm hoping maybe some of those guys dropped in tonight. They're fly guys. Um, I try to post pictures on there. I get, you know, harassed because, you know, I have a Eagles hat on and an anthrax t-shirt and I use spinning tackle. So I'm kind of the outcast down there. But, you know, to me, sh a Shad is a Shad. I don't care how you catch it. It's, you know, it's all fun. Um, but these guys, you know, they're obsessed with, with fly fishing down there. I think, you know, your group and their group would get along really well. So again, it's called Shad on the Fly. Uh, it's a Facebook page. Um, um, I actually stole a couple of um, pictures from them uh, and that I use on my, my talk here. But, you know, a good bunch of guys and, you know, they, they are obsessed with catching shad and, you know, they can tell you more about the flies than I can. So I'm going to give you general locations and show you some scenery um, and answer hopefully some questions. So I'm going to keep going. But again, there's there's no t boat rentals anymore in this area. We actually found a person uh, who rents boats and he delivers a boat to the dock. It's a pontoon boat. We fit four guys in there. We go up and down the river for the whole day, have lunch. It's, it's fantastic. Um, but it's a shame that it's not, it's not more accessible to other people unless you live there and have a boat. And I think maybe a kayak could do some of these areas too. So the St. John's River Basin, um, its headwaters, again, I, I, don't, I think I forgot to mention, this river flows to the north. Um, starts around Vero Beach, sorry for the cloudy picture, I didn't think it was that blurry, uh, but all the way down at the bottom of the red section, um, that's called the upper basin section, where most of the fly fishermen and myself congregate because of the flow. I told you about, you know, it, it, it has the, you know, almost the Niagara River-like flow of 2.6 inches per mile. So it's, it's about as fast as it can get there. Uh, it, and it exits out by Jacksonville to the north. So the general area we fish is Sanford. 
Um, I can show you with my pointer and, I, and I'm gonna zoom in on this. So Sanford, there's the Orlando Sanford Airport. Orlando is just to the south here. Um, the area we're talking about, Shad Alley, is about where my, excuse me, my pointer is right here. So I'm gonna go on to the next slide. And here it is. So this area right here that I'm circling is called Cameron White um, Boat Launch. And it's, it's, a, it's an improved launch. And it's that little white road section there where the launch is. That is the former location of um, a huge tackle store that ran the tournaments for the shad and crappy derbies they had um, and the boat library. There were two or three of them right in that general area around the bridge. This is Route 46. This is all redone. And I'm going to outline the area that we shad fish in. And you can see this nice bend section right here uh, is probably one of the most significant um, structures in the whole river as far as depth goes and speed. Um, all the way up through here is considered Shad Alley. Um, my rudimentary red, red mark, the X marks the spot for the uh, Cameron White boat launch um, where the man delivers our boat. And then the rest of the red is our general pathway along that river. Um, one of the things I want to talk about is, is some of the uh, old wives tales that kind of surround shad fishing. Um, Every place I go geographically, there's some old wives tale that's out there. Um, in 1989, when I arrived down there and you know rented the boat, they told me that I needed to use tater bugs for bait. I said, what? Shad eat tater bugs. And by the way, you can only catch them in the evening here. Okay, I've been fishing for shad for you know 10 years. I know that morning is a good bite. So we were out you know at dawn the next morning catching shad and not on tater bugs. And you know we were kind of the rebels down there. We were kids. And, you know, people saw us pulled over and casting that, what are you guys doing? What are you, what are you doing? You can only catch shad by trolling in the evening. I said, okay, as I'm reeling a shad in, you might want to try this different. I actually met a man down there that's become a lifelong friend. His name's Rob Bennett. He's a, he's a fishing guide in South Carolina and, and him and I met on this river and he, you know, I was a damn Yankee and he was a murderous rebel and we get along just great. And it's, and it's a fun time. But anyway, back to the tater bugs. These guys told me that I had to use, you know, a shad dart that looked like a tater bug. And they sold these white darts with black spots. Man, I'm not using a tater bug. I got chartreuse stuff that we've been using. And, and it was that about that time that flutter spoons became a thing on the Delaware River. We were casting spoons and catching them, darts and catching them. It was, it was really cool. And we shared some of that information with people. And people then started to, you know, pull over. Every year, I'd see people now anchored and, and casting, which, just like in the Potomac, pick a good spot with some current, you're gonna catch a shad sooner or later. So anyway, if anybody sees any tater darts, let me know. It's kind of a collector's item at this point. So this is the scenery on the St. John's River. This picture is borrowed from the uh, Shad on the Fly group. It's one of their, their pictures. I've taken some of these, this is one of theirs, but this is generally a section, you know, with some, we'll call it rapid water there. You can see the, that there's absolutely no, no, no speed to this river whatsoever. Um, the far bank left side generally has gators on it. You know, it's a great place for basking. Uh, again, the scenery is beautiful. It's, it's one of the most unique places in the world I know to catch shad. Um, sunsets there, always beautiful. Uh, you know, crazy Spanish moss, still some trees with, you know, some leaves on it. The palm trees there, obviously. Uh, it's just a beautiful place. Even if I didn't catch a shad, it would still be a cool place to hang out. Yeah, I mean, it's... Again, it's it's beautiful here. Um, some of the, I guess there are a lot of, there's a lot of cypress trees there too, which are the ones that have lost their leaves there. Gators, there's gators all over this place. And like I said, the upper section of the river where the fly fishermen go, they, they talk about, you know, wading and they'll see, you know, a, some nostrils come up and some eyes looking at them and they know to back out. A lot of these gators are, you know, 10 plus feet long. These are not small gators. And, uh, I don't, I don't experience them in the boat. I can, I can, I can stay away from them, thankfully. Um, go to the next slide. So this is our view every morning. You know, we, we will put out from the launch and we'll kind of cruise up the river. It's, again, it's, it's beautiful here. So here's some pictures I found from 1982. There's me on the left, a lot more hair, a lot less beard. Still, uh, still some shorts and catching shad. Hopefully, um, my dad on the right hand side and my friend Tom Graham. We, they were, they were the ones that you know embarked on this journey with me. Um, and it's been, yeah, it's been a great, great time down there. So, 
So here's, this is a hickory shad from Shad Alley. Um, you know, the, the, it, it's weird that the hickory shad, and, and there's a lot of controversy about, you know, shad surviving the spawn in Florida and everything I've read. And, you know, a lot of the shad on the fly guys will disagree with me and, and that's cool. I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, but everything that's, that they've read and the biologists have seen, the American shad don't survive the spawn. Uh, they just don't. The water temperature, it's the only river in the world where the water temperature actually has to cool off to get temperatures that the shad can survive in. And this river is a, you know, low country, hot river. It's probably in the 90s in the summertime or hotter. You know, in by the time December hits in January, you know, Jacksonville will start to cool off a little bit at the, near the mouth and then the shad will start moving in. But there's a good population of hickory shad and they are all, you know, sizes like the Potomac when you catch, you know, little eight inch, little jack, you know, 10 inch long hickory shad. Uh, you can catch 20 inch, three pound plus hickory shad down here. They're, they're big. And so that tells me that they do survive. And some of the controversy that, you know, the, the, the Southern, the Florida guys and I talk about is do they eat? You know, hickory shad to me are minnow feeders and we catch them, you know, in the Jersey shore around the rock piles where there's currents. Um, they typically are minnow eaters and the American shad are filter feeders. Um, they claim that, you know, they, they pull a shad aside and, and, and guys have videos of them you know, with these live gambusias in their hand, they're saying that they eat gambusia, which are, you know, minnows, they're, they're mosquito fish, and they were regurgitating live minnows. I guess I'd have to see it to believe it. Uh, I would more believe it on a hickory shad than I would on an American shad. But anyway, that's one of the, one of the many topics of conversation on the shad on the fly group. There's an American shad, and you can see it's, pretty much the same size as that last hickory shad. And this is a huge American shad down there. I mean, this is pushing probably three and a half pounds. I mean, I didn't weigh it, you know, took a quick picture, let them go. Um, but the state record is 5.19 pounds. That was from 1990, 5.19 pounds. Before that, in the, in the late eighties, it was four pounds, 12 ounces. And, you know, these are small fish that, that, that's a non-returning, you know, maybe a, five-year-old or a six-year-old maybe you know maybe spawn later or something but that five pound fish in florida is so rare like I, you just never see anything close to that my friend tom and i in a rainstorm the hickory shad this is the very beginning of um shad alley you'll see this sign right here the no wake zone there's a floating dock here and then behind him around the corner is the cameron white boat launch. So this literally is the first pool we pull over and fish. Crappies, a lot of crappies. This year we probably caught more crappies than I've ever seen. Um, some of them exceeding 15 inches and two pounds. I mean, a lot of the locals, they, they go down there and they load up with crappies. So, you know, it's just a bycatch as far as we're concerned. Still fun to catch, something to catch in January. Another, another row shad from, from Shad Alley. Um, so this picture shows the darts that I use. I am a dart guy. Sorry, fly fisherman, but that, that's these sections of river. You know, I, I try to kind of coach some of the fly guys and say, find the shad first and then switch over to your darts. I mean, that, that's, that would be the way to do it. But these deep pools, some of them are 25, 30 feet deep uh, and with some significant current and, you know, flies, you know, you'd have to really, you know, do all the sinking tip and lead weighted eyes and all that stuff. But you know, a lot of the people troll until they find some fish and then, you know, we troll and then we like, okay, we'll pull over and we'll start casting here. And it tends to work. Again, some scenery. This is probably around the corner from Shad Alley. The tree up here uh, has a resident um, raccoon, crawls out of the top and then belly crawls his way down the tree. We saw him several times one day, actually pretty funny. So. Again, you never know what you're going to see. I mean, this, this the bird life here is incredible. I, I, in the background, you can see all the white ibis and the storks and things. There's a crappie. Good old crappie. There are a lot of them in here. Uh, there's tilapia in here, too. Uh, and, and actually, there's a commercial fisherman who launches out of the launching site that I told you, Cameron White. And he just puts across the river probably 50 yards throws a 20 foot diameter cast net and he fills his buckets with tilapia and sells them to the local fish store. And it's, you know, obviously it's a non-native invasive. There's no limit on these things. 
apparently the ones that are coming from the river are like the best eating, way better than any farm raised fish that you would buy in the store. So a lot of tilapia and a lot of the fly guys catch them on very small flies. Uh, there's a ton of sunshine bass in here too. And if you look at the shadow or yeah, shadow on the fly site, they have reported more sunshine bass than I've ever seen since I've been following these guys for a couple of years now, but beautiful fish. Um, I, I do hear complaints that, you know, they're eating the shad fry and they are stocked fish. Um, and they apparently don't survive very well in the wintertime when the water gets too um, warm. Uh, they, they apparently will congregate in the springs uh, and they can survive in their water temperature and they are 72 year round. Um, but you know, when the water's in the nineties, I guess 70 is, is considered cool. So there's their group, uh, shad on the fly. I, you know, I hope you guys, you know, remember this name and try to join up. It's a good, it, it's a, it's a good group. Again, a lot of shared information. These guys are very forthcoming with their info, uh, always willing to help each other. They have, you know, meets on the weekends where they tend to, uh, you know, hike in a lot of mileage. Like I think some of these hikes are four or five, six miles through swamp and mosquitoes and gators and everything else. And they get to those banks and they fish. So, you know, it would be, a, uh, you know, a, definitely a place, a good resource to ask questions if anybody wants to go down to Florida, you know, to try to fish down there. Uh, this book is very well written. It's got fantastic maps, uh, it's specifically on the Upper Johns River Basin, which I had shown earlier on that slide with the red, with the red outline. Um, this guy, um, I don't, I don't know him personally. Um, he, he's a fly fisherman. Lots of good fly fishing information. Again, they talk about the shad eating gambusia, which are mosquito fish. Not sure that I buy that, but it's okay. We can agree to disagree. Um, but you know, they they tie their flies to look like a gambusia, which is only about a one inch long silver minnow. Um, my opinion would be, you know tie the gambusia pattern, but make it chartreuse so it's a little more visible in the tannic acid water. But again, they, they catch fish on them. Um, a lot of the fish that they seem to catch are about right now. Uh, they are probably in the middle of the spawn, if not done the spawn down there at this point. And so a lot of the fish, you know, I, I tend to see a lot of spawned out fish tend to bite a lot better sometimes. So anyway, decent book. It's, uh, you can get, I think it's about 12 bucks or something. Uh, so here it is. There's shad candy. These gambusias are these, these, you know, silvery minnows that, you know, the shad supposedly eat. The Florida guys, you know, tie their flies after it. All well and good. They do catch fish on their, their, their patterns. Um, oh, this is a, a segment of, of that book, just to show you, um, you know, how detailed this is. He, he actually documents where the, uh, the channel is, you know, go around the fence and walk along the slough. I mean, it's very, very detailed. So it's, it's a fantastic resource um, crossing low, low water here. It's, it's very well written. Like I said, his maps are well worth the price. Um, again, where to go. Uh, so that kind of just talks about the whole upper section of the St. John's River, uh, starting with Cameron White, which is the first square um, red area at the top by Lake Monroe. Lower Wakiba River is the one I talked about where the first year we couldn't find uh, a boat to get us to Shad Alley and we found the outlet of the, the Wakiba. It's, uh, it's a really cool swampy area and we only caught hickory shad in there. Don't know if American shad tend to push into there. It's a very small water. Um, my guess is they don't, but you know, <clears throat> I was happy catching some hickory shad. Excuse me. So this is just some of the cypress knees uh, in the swamps around the Wakiva. Uh, again, the scenery is just cool. All the old, you know, the cypress trees with no, no leaves and the Spanish moss. And, you know, you're casting against the banks there uh, where there's some current and, you know, you never know what you're gonna get. We do catch occasional, those sunshine bass, crappy largemouth sunfish. Like I said, roseate spoonbills are there. They're absolutely beautiful birds. Uh, there's Wakiva River Shad from my friends, Tom and Bruce, and a crappie, or more spoonbills. Uh, there's a, one of the springs there is called the Blue Spring State Park. Uh, manatees, I've seen manatees probably 50 or more at one time in there. And when the water gets cold in the river, in the 50s, when it becomes good for the shad, the actual manatees start to migrate up into the, the blue spring because it's uh, it's warm, comparatively speaking, at 72. 
there are literally tarpon and snook, you know, ocean fish. And that's probably where we're fishing is 100, 150 miles from the ocean, give or take. There's tarpon, snook, uh, all these catfish, uh, Placostomus, which are, you know, aquarium armored catfish and shad all swimming together along with the manatees in these pools. Actually a, an amazing sight. Here's some pictures we took in the rain one day that, you know, the manatees are all over the surface and all under there. They're, they're just literally waiting there, hoping that it gets warmer. This is the name of the company that we rent the boat from. Uh, Captain Mike has been good to us all these years. You know, this pontoon boat is awesome. Boats to your rentals. Um, just figured I'd throw that out there for anyone who was interested in, you know, trying to, to find a boat out there. Uh, you could definitely find some kayak rentals there also. So you could kayak your way up. Um, I don't know that I want to kayak when it's warm and the gators are around, but it's definitely it's definitely doable when the water's colder. Another beautiful sunset on the St. John's. And actually, we stay on a house right on the river. Our boat's docked there. We just drive right out. And then, you know, we hit the river for, you know, 12 hours or so. At this point, I'm going to uh, see, I think we were talking about, Ben was going to ask, see if there were any questions specifically about Florida shad fishing. Yeah, um, we have a couple here for you, uh, Bill. One question that came in, <coughs> whether they re reintroduced shad to Shad Alley, or is that all natural? This is all natural. As far as I know, there's never been any stocking of the shad here. Um, but the, the, the Reader's Digest condensed book I had was from the 60s. So Shad Alley has been a known thing for, you know, 50 years, 60 years, actually. Yeah. So as nowhere have I ever heard of them actually restocking Shad there. Great. And then we have a, another question, I think probably that relates somewhat to fishing kind of such a lake-like river. Um, kind of the relationship between depth and location. So if, if nothing's happening, uh, if nothing's biting, is it more likely that you're not dialed in at the right depth or in the not, not the right lo location or, 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 or both? The, um, just a question that came. So if you were a first time fisherman there, you would definitely um, try to fish Shad Alley, in my opinion. You know, that area is, is like the place. And it's a shame that the, the boat rentals aren't there anymore. Because it, there were literally hundreds of people out fishing on a weekend in that section. It was great. Um, and that is the spot where every, every spot for probably a mile of, of river is shad habitat because there's actually some current and depth. Um, anywhere else, you've got to do some homework by, you know, finding some more current and depth. And it's, you know, you can do it. You just, you just kind of ride around and find it. It's like anywhere else, you know, find find specific habitats so that there's, you know, a little bit of oxygen and some, some movement over their gills and they're going to hang there because otherwise they're sitting in a lake. And I would imagine the shad blasts through those lake pretty, pretty quickly. Great. And then Bill, the final one for you, then we'll, we'll move on. Uh, just can you remind people kind of what the, the peak time and, and kind of uh, what the date range to go is? Okay. So, it always was in the 90s around the Super Bowl. That's when I would be there. I, I, we, we would go in the Super Bowl, and that was considered by the guys uh, that own the shop. Um, I can't remember the name of the shop. But anyway, the shop that was right on the river there, um, JJ's Marina Isle. I talked to them uh, often and picked their brains a little bit. And it was, you know, mid-January to mid-February was like the peak. You can catch them in mid-December, but it's weather dependent. If they don't get really cold weather and that water's in the 80s, there's no shad that are pushing in the river as far as I can tell. Um, but once it drops, and it always will, there's always cold fronts that come through Florida, you know, that, that push of fish will move quickly in the river and there's no resistance. It's not like they have to swim against heavy current like you would see in our, you know, Northeastern rivers. They're literally flying through lakes. I'm sure they move a lot faster than the reported, you know, four to six miles a day that they go in, in like the Delaware River, say. Um, don't know what that is. I don't think anybody's ever done a tagging study on these things, um, but it's, it's, it's pretty amazing that they make it through these lakes and actually find their way into some current. But mid-January to mid-February would be the prime time. And I say, you know, the old Super Bowl was the last week in January. I, you know, the Eagles were never in it, so I was always able to go <laughs> shad fishing because there was nothing to watch at that point, right? Um, but yeah, so the, 
So, you know, late, late January, you're guaranteed fish, you know, and certainly into early February. Great. Thanks, Bill. And Jim, I just see you have your, your hand raised and one, one to see if you want to come in before we move on. Yeah, I wanted to, uh, that was an excellent talk. I always wondered what happened in St. John's, but several people tonight have talked about what to shad eat. But when they're in the rivers, they really don't eat anything, the American shad. Um, you know, they've turned from a saltwater fish to a freshwater fish. And in that tremendous transition, their alimentary canal is very much just a straight line from gullet to their, to their banal vent. And um, I've dissected hundreds and hundreds of shad and never found anything in their stomachs. Not that something couldn't get in there, and there might be an exception, but they don't really eat. But what they're doing with the minnows, the biggest predator for shad in these rivers are minnows, because they're eating their eggs and larvae. So these adult shad, which don't build a nest or do any kind of parental care, but they do want to chase the minnows away. So what they're doing is striking at minnows to keep the minnow population away from their eggs and, and developing larvae. So that's why I, yeah, when, I, when you saw that potato bug thing, I was just laughing as well. You know, they're really just chasing whatever. And those gambusia might be the, the primary minnow down there. I don't know, up, up in the Potomac is spot tail shiners and stuff. So, so that's, I just want to input on the, the issue of what are the shad eating? They're not really eating these minnows. They're striking at them to get them the heck out of the way. So that's about it. And that was a great talk. I've been wondering. I thought the St. John's, which which you showed, it goes from the, you know, two thirds of the way down Florida, and it flows north up to yeah. uh, Jacksonville. And I thought that the shad might be concentrating around Jacksonville, and to find that you were finding them well south of there, uphill, so to speak, in the right. upper part of that thirty foot drop. Uh, that's interesting. So thanks. Yeah, it's literally the only place with any current, other than the tidal section down by Jacksonville. And there's no one I know of, or I've never read anything about anybody targeting or finding them in that area. That, you know. Well, they swim through there. On yeah. time. I personally think you should uh, take the time you need. Um, okay, I mean, I'll, you know, I, there's not a whole lot on the North Carolina stuff. There's some pictures and some general areas. You know, I'll keep that brief if that's okay. Okay, I, but I that is an area people can go right now. Yeah. So I want people to right. see what you've been up to. Right. So yeah, so so North Carolina. This this is an awesome picture that was taken by some of uh, some of the people that hang out below the Conowingo Dam. Um, so many eagles there. I don't know if you guys have ever gotten there. Anyone who has knows you can see flocks of eagles. And this was a shot taken um, uh, probably the first week of March. And you know everyone there says, oh, there's no shad here in March. And I catch shad there, and people catch shad there, and they they say, oh no, there's no. Shad and well, there I, I brought this over to the biologist. I go, so tell me there's no American shad here because this was photographed on you know March 1st or 2nd, whatever the day was. And they, oh, maybe it's just one. Well, whatever. Anyway, so that, that's just a great picture to start off the talk. So North Carolina shad fishing. Um, so I'm going to start with just the Pamlico Basin. Uh, there's two rivers that flow into the Pamlico Basin. The Noose Noose River is is really the first. Uh, area that I see reporting shad catches in late January. Uh, the noose is the, is a little bit southern or a little bit south of the Tar River. Um, the, the fishing, it's mostly hickory shad, uh, very, very few American shad until you get to the dam at Wiggins Mill, which is on the other side of, or the west side of I-95. And they, it basically seems like there's an a American shad hitch, hitch, fishery there and every other place around Grifton and Kinston, Gouldsboro, they all seem to be just hickory shad. Um, 275 miles long, it's a 5,600 square mile drainage basin, and that river is always flooded. It's, it's a very dark colored tannic acid river, and it's always flooded. And uh, although this year it's kind of a low water year, um, have not fished the noose yet, uh, but I've been fishing the Tar River. I fished the Tar River last week, um, they show up about, you know, by the first weekend in February, they're catching shad. They catch a good mix of American and hickories in this river. Um, Greenville, Rocky Mount, Rocky Mount is actually where I'm staying tonight. Uh, I was fishing the Tar River right down the road. We didn't catch any shad. Uh, we got in on a striper blitz, and I think I, I downloaded one picture to show you at the end. Stripers, I, I, my friend Tom is in the room here with me. We caught, I don't know, 
15 between us in an hour. Probably, yeah, something like that, which is pretty good. You know, anywhere from 15 to 28 inches, 26 inches. Um, decent, a decent night. I had one hickory shad hit and lost it. Um, anyway, so here's a picture of the, the sound. You can see the Noose River is uh, the southern tributary and the Tar River is the north. Lots of other small tributaries. I've caught them in a bunch of those. Um, but the tar and the noose definitely concentrate uh, the fish populations. Uh, there's uh, North Carolina, their, uh, their DCNR has a great website. Um, and the fishing is really centered around the boat launches. Um, a lot of these are swampy areas, you know, way in the woods, not much access. But anytime there's a boat launch, everyone congregates around there. And, you know, there's some bridges, there's some current changes, things like that. Um, it's a great resource to find, to find a place to fish in North Carolina. Hickory shad from last week, the scales on the bank there are not for my fish. Uh, there are a, a lot of people in North Carolina tend to keep and eat their fish, whatever. Uh, their limit is 10 a day. Uh, there's a website for, uh, I'm sorry, a Facebook page also, nc-shad. Uh, it's a great resource for finding out where, but you're going to see a lot of death shots, uh, a lot of pickup trucks with 20 dead shad rolled up in the leaves in the mud. Um, my friend uh, Tom nicknamed them uh, Shake and Bake, uh, and you'll see some pictures of Shake and Bake later on. But again, it's a great place to fish. There's a lot of good fishermen. Um, I've never seen anybody fly fishing here, generally spinning tackle. Um, again, these rivers are dark, dark, tannic acid color. You know, bright color is definitely better for visibility. So Tar River Hickory Shad, that is the junction of Town Creek with uh, the Tar River. These are some bigger American shad just up river in Battle Park, which is uh, the, the northern or the utmost reaches of the shad run. They, uh, there's a small dam there, they can't uh, reach it. And you definitely have a concentration of American shad in this area. Um, that's my son, Willie. Um, uh, definitely big concentration of American shad here. Uh, Downriver, five miles, you get mostly hickory shad with probably 10% American shad mixed in. And, that, and up in this area, it's, it's the exact opposite. Maybe 10% hickory shad, 90% American. So that's Battle Park. A lot of double headers here. This is one from the other day, just a you know, male, female double. <laughs> So this is the typical color of the river on the tar. It's always got this brown color. Not sure if it was, you know, there's legend that you know, there was some civil war action where they dumped some oil in here. So they called it the Tar River. I've read several different accounts of why it's called this, but the most consensus seems to be it's the color. It never clears up. Probably today, I would say there was two-ish feet of visibility, which is a really about as good as it gets. Um, and this river is really low right now. I mean, it's 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 very, very low, probably lowest, you know, 90 percentile as far as low water goes. My friend Tom and my myself on the Noose River last year or two years ago, when the river was so flooded, we stood in the parking lot uh, of the boat launch and caught shad after shad because the river was, I don't know, 15 feet above its normal level. And you know, we were we were basically on the shore here, you know, the 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 actual pool is probably, you know, four bridge girders out into the water and we're, we're way on the land. We're standing in the parking lot. Uh, so the, the North Carolina rig or the Southern rig, we call it, is a curly tail jig. I've never seen anybody use darts here. Uh, curly tail jigs, you know, 99% of people use that or, and trail and they put two together, you know, in tandem or they'll drag, um, you know, a nun guesser spoon. Hickory shad are, again, heavy minnow feeders I see in the surf, and maybe they hit spoons because of that, but they really tend to hit silver spoons. And uh, yeah, th this is more old wives' tail stuff. You know, they only hit curly tail grubs, and I just go, okay, and I throw a dart in, and I catch just as many buddy as anybody else using a curly tail. So to me, a shad's gonna hit something that's bright and in its way, and, you know, get it out of the way. I guess that's like, like Jim was talking about. Let's, who knows why they strike, but that's as good a reason as any, or as good as a theory as any. Uh, so North Carolina, NC-SHAD is the Facebook page. There's a 5,000 members. Um, 
There's a picture of a shad on a shake and bake, and that's a typical report you'll see, you know, a shad that's rolled around in the mud. And it, it really has to do with where the, the fishing occurs. There's not much bank space. It's, it's all, you know, river eroded in the wintertime. And by the time you get there in the springtime, it's just a mud pit. And, you know, it is, it is that, but, you know, it's kind of a joke that my friend Tom, who's fishing with me today, calls it shake and bake. And now it's kind of caught on and people are now often calling each other shake and bake. Uh, just typical scene on the, uh, this is the Noose River further down. Um, beautiful area to fish. It is very remote, that's for sure. That's from today. So we were catching striper after striper. This is the Tar River. Um, anybody that knows me knows that stripers are my least favorite fish because they kill shad. Uh, I kind of say that tongue in cheek. I, you know, stripers are okay, whatever. I, I think they're the most overprotected fish in the ocean. Um, but here again, we just one after the other, they were, they were blitzing little three inch, look like miniature, you know, baby gizzard or yeah, gizzard shad were floating down the river and they would, the school would just absolutely crush them when they came by. They would give themselves away. They jump, we would throw our darts and spoons in there, immediate hookup. It was, it was a pretty fun hour tonight. So I think that's all my slides. Yes, it is. So anyway, more questions, North Carolina. I know that was brief. Uh, there's a lot of rivers in North Carolina that are, that are fishable. Uh, the Roanoke River is, is really, from anybody coming from the Potomac, it's just across the North Carolina border. Um, Weldon is the, is the location. If you sign up for the NC-SHAD site, you would see people talking about when they show up. It's a bottom release hydroelectric dam. So the fish tend to be a little, the water tends to be colder and the fish don't bite well for another, probably by the 1st of March. Um, but, you know, you, by the 1st of February, you can catch plenty of shad in the Tar River and the Noose. Uh, again, I, I don't think, Mark, I think what did we talk about? Is it, I don't even think it's three hours from Washington uh, down to these locations. Anyway, so again, any other questions? Anybody have a question? You know, I'll Bill, we have a question about uh, did uh, skipping, what about South Carolina? South Carolina, there's not a lot known. It's extremely remote. I do fish the Santee and the Cooper Rivers down there, plus a couple of the tributaries up river, but there, there are definitely hydroelectric dams. There's a dam that has a lock, and they actually lock boats up and down, and the shad make it through those locks and get into the upper stretches of the river, and I've caught them well above those dams, you know, probably 50, 60 miles, and only because, you know, I, I met some of the people that Captain Rob that I met on the, you know, down in Florida, he told me, hey, there's shad up river here. And damn if they weren't. And they had gotten through the, the locks. So the Santee and the Cooper, um, and they start getting them there. They're, they say they get them. I've never caught them probably before, you know, late January, but they say by Christmas, there's plenty of shad in the in those tail races at, you know, St. Stephen's is the tail race on the on either the Santee or the Cooper. I think it's the Cooper. I don't know. One of them. But they both connect each other. Great. Thanks, Bill. And we had a, a similar question just about kind of best time for these North Car Carolina rivers. Is it now? Oh, yeah. Right now is the time to be here. Um, so today's the 24th, right? Um, I would say that you're approaching the peak of the run in the Tar River and the Noose both. Um, you know, you're, you're, they've, they've caught fish here for a month already. So think about how that relates to any of the timing you have in the Potomac, right? It's you know, that first month, you know, it builds, it builds, it builds, and then you start to see spawning temps. It's in the 50s in the water here. I, I didn't have a thermometer, but it's probably mid 50s. Um, so you're, you're starting to get towards spawning time, probably in the next two weeks, they'll start to spawn and you have all the way through, you know, mid April. And then by, by mid April, you're looking at spawned out fish for the next couple of weeks. Great. And again, these fish are probably not surviving the spawn. Okay. Not many. Gotcha. We have a question here too. What what would your recommendations be for a fly fisher approaching one of these rivers? So the Tar River is is much smaller. Uh, I would Battle Park is an area like that. That is a you know a mecca for people. There's a boat launch there. There's tons of shore access locations. You could easily catch shad with a fly right there. Very reachable. Uh, this spot I was fishing here today, right below one of the bridges near Battle Park. It, I don't know, distance-wise, is it 100 feet apart? I don't think that river was 100 feet wide. Yeah, no. 
80 feet wide. And, the, and you know, if the river was a little higher, the shad would probably be up in these upper pools. Um, but, you know, Battle Park would be an area that I would, I would recommend for sure. And that's the Tar River right in Rocky Mount. Great. Thanks, Bill. Mark, I think you might have a, a, a question. Well, I was just going to um, say that that shot of the eagle um, oh, yeah. and, and weather shatter in the river in March. Um, you know, I remember the Joe Fletcher saying that, uh, oh, shatter here, you know, in March. And that was back, you know, before climate change. But here's here's what I think the key is the, the fish might arrive in March, but they're not hitting lures. The, until the water temperature reaches a certain point. Agreed. So, um, so I think it, you know it's correct to say it either way that they're <laughs> they're not there until they hit, but they are in fact there. So, um, and so right now I'm sure there's plenty of shad in the Potomac. Um, we'll see them hit in a few weeks, but um, one one year Alex did hook a shad in February, uh, American shad from a boat in February. And coincidentally, it was the day they um, had a ceremony on the Anacostia honoring um, American shad as the, uh, the official fish of the District of Columbia. <laughs> so that was, that was really something. But do you find the um, runs starting earlier than they did 20 years ago? That's what I'm seeing here. So I'm one of the guys that's probably on the river way before a shad uh, will bite. Uh, so I have, you know, I, I grew up fishing the Trenton power plant, which is on Tidewater on the Delaware River. Every year, no matter what the river temperature was, we caught shad the last week of February. And that was in the lower Delaware, the tidal section. And only because that power plant put out, you know, water that was 50 degrees, you know, it was, it was at least 10 degrees. And back in the you know early 80s, it was probably more like 15, 20 degrees warmer. And, and you wouldn't catch them above there and you wouldn't catch them below there, but you would catch them there. Then it warms up, water temperature starts to rise. You know, we actually catch them in water temperatures in the lower section of the river in the first week of March. And the water temperature can be 42, 43 degrees. And there's such a huge push of fish, I, I think it kind of concentrates on where we are and you'll, you'll finally get one to strike. And they're usually hooked in the nose or something weird, right? You know, they, they're not striking correctly. But yeah. you know, to answer your question, I think the shad have always been there early. And I think a lot of people wait until it's, oh, oh you know, the, the typical, oh, when the dogwoods bloom. Well, you know, when the dogwoods are blooming, to me, the shad season's over. <laughs> I like to fish when the trees are bare and that's when the first and the biggest and the strongest fish are in the river. Um, I don't know that they're coming up earlier. I think there's more awareness of it. And again, I've been, I've been fishing, you know, I fished for shad in February, starting in 1980 in, in the Delaware river. And, you know, if they're there, then they're certainly in every river South of there, they would have to be, um, you know, and I didn't catch the first one and no one that, that was not the first shad in the river. I guarantee you that. So, yeah, I, you know, in the Potomac, it, it, you have to have a rising you know, temperature, at least in the lower 40s, you know, and, and I, I think you could get a couple of fish to strike. Water temperature in the lower 40s? Yeah, we catch them in the, in the lower Delaware. There's a place in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, where there's a pinch point and every shad in the river has to come through there. And it's a section that's uh, maybe 60 feet wide. And that's where a couple of, you know, old timers, I, I'm a medium timer compared to these guys. These guys are in their 70s and 80s. Um, and they're fishing for shad because they know they're there in their first week of March and they're catching them at four in 42 degree water. Wow. Yeah. We're going to have to try harder here. I think every year when we record the first catch, it's, it's been in the uh, low fifties. Bill, I have another question here for you. What city yeah. or cities on the Tar River do you recommend? So uh, uh, again, I'm in Rocky Mount, North Carolina right now. Um, it's prop from from my house, just outside of Philadelphia, it's just under six hours. So again, you guys are, you know, you're probably three, three and a half hours to hear it. Um, that, that's one of the towns, that's where Battle Park is. The other place I would recommend in another week, like get yourself into March and watch those reports on NC-SHAD on Facebook. And you'll see when Weldon on the Roanoke River 
is, is getting hot. There's a huge boat launch there and it's a party. I mean, there is a lot of people fishing there on the bank. Be prepared to see a lot of shake and bake and fish in buckets because a lot of people love to fish for catfish and eat them and so be it. That's what the regulations are. But Weldon in, 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 on the Roanoke River, first week in March, and then right now through, you know, all the way through March in, in um, Rocky Mount, North Carolina. Right. And we have a question here, Bill. Any, anything equivalent to Fletcher's in North Carolina? <laughs> For boat rentals? I, I don't know any place here that rents boats. Again, all the fishing is concentrated around the boat launches. You know, a lot of the locals, they bring their boat in and they, uh, and they launch their boat and they fish, you know, but there's, there's plenty of bank space at all of the locations. Um, I don't know anywhere that that rents boats. There, there's there's plenty of bank space here as compared to Florida, where there is almost no bank space without hiking for miles. Sure. So the, you know you could you could certainly fish here um, from the bank. Excellent, the, well, Bill. Do you do you know anything about the Ogeechee in Georgia? I've only heard about it. Georgia is the Georgia and Maine are the two states on the East Coast I haven't caught a shad in yet. Um, someday I'll get there. Uh, actually, I want to catch an Alabama shad on the Panhandle too. But I, I don't know anything other than that they that there used to be, and I actually had called the place back in the '90s. There was a boat rental place there uh, somewhere, and I can you know someday, Mark, I'll dig up my notes of all my handwritten stuff before the internet existed. <laughs> okay. Great. Hey, Bill, thank you so much. Yeah. What a what a wealth of information.